Welcome to Living Word Lutheran Church. We're glad to have you worshiping with us today as we come together as a church family, uh, even though we're doing so online. And as we look at the days that we find ourselves in right now, uh, we find ourselves in some pretty unusual and strange days, uh, ones that I think are going to be remembered by Christ Church for many years. And even though these days that we're in are, are maybe uncharted waters for us as we go forward, I want to remind you that these days aren't a surprise to God. And God isn't looking at our current circumstance and scratching his head and saying, oh, I wonder how this is happening. I didn't see it coming. No, but God is looking at this and is sovereign and in control of it all. And there's one thing he's given to us that is certain that we can hold to and cling to during that time. And that is the certainty of his word. Uh, each and every one of you, I would invite to not waste this opportunity that you have to dig into the word of God, uh, to grow and, and invest spiritually, and to see what God would do in your hearts and lives. It's my prayer that this church service can be part of that and welcome you to be ministered to by God's word today. In times like these take time to do every week here at our church is to acknowledge our need for Jesus. You see, each and every one of us have a brokenness in our life. Our lives have been filled with things that we've said or thought or done that go against the holy will of God. And so we come together as a bunch of, of needy people in need of God's grace, in need of his mercy for our lives, in need of a savior to come and bring us out of this pit of despair. And so we join together confessing our sins and looking for our Savior Jesus. Would you join me now? Almighty God, our Maker and Redeemer, we poor sinners confess to you that we are by nature sinful and unclean, and that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. Therefore, we flee for refuge to your infinite mercy and ask you for Christ's sake, Grant us forgiveness of all our sins, and by your Holy Spirit, increase in us true knowledge of you, and of your will, and true obedience to your word, to the end that by your grace we may come to eternal life, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The promise we hear from God's word is that he separates our sin as far as the east is from the west. So far has he removed our sins from us. He looks at us and he says, this is promise from Isaiah chapter 1. Though your sins were red as scarlet, you will be made white as snow. And when God looks at you in light of his son Jesus Christ, he doesn't see someone who is filled with brokenness and sin. But he looks at a forgiven saint, somebody who he's called a child of God. And for those of you who are trusting in Jesus Christ this morning, that's true for you. God looks at you, not in light of your sin, but in light of his son, Jesus Christ. In times like these, you need the Bible. In times like these, hope oh, be not idle. Be there. Rock. 
things that we do on a weekly basis here at Living Word is take time to pray for one another in our church family. And so just would invite you to join me in a time of congregational prayer. Heavenly Father, we bow before you as a whole church uh, community. Lord, we come before you and ask that you would take note of the situations both in, in our church, uh, our community, uh, our nation, and around the world. Lord, there are many people that we are aware of, some of, some of our own church members who are suffering and hurting, uh, maybe who have lost their jobs or have had their hours reduced. We pray, Lord, that you would supply for their needs, uh, give them this day their daily bread. We would ask that you would make all of their needs met and, and to use us as a church to come alongside and help and support them in that as well. We pray, Lord, for peace and calm to reign in the hearts of your people to reign in the hearts of this country and around the world, that you would be one who would speak into their lives and remind them that you are in control of all things. We pray for our leadership of this country and other country leadership around our world. We pray that you would give wisdom to the rulers and kings, presidents that you've appointed, that you would help them as they try to lead us through this, and that that would be truly wisdom that they recognize that comes from you. I also pray, Lord, for an opportunity for your church within this time. Lord, that you would be turning people's hearts back to you. That they would be seeking you as they have time and, and the quietness of their homes, Lord. That they would use this time to invest in their own spiritual life. Lord, that you would, by your Holy Spirit, prompt them to go and dig into your word. And to listen to it being proclaimed through, to, through sermons or Bible studies. Lord, that they wouldn't waste this opportunity that's in front of them. Lord, all of these things we pray, looking to you as the one who is in control and guiding us through this. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. church has continued to remind itself about what it believes. And one of the reasons why it's done that is because the very message of salvation and of God's work throughout time is so impactful in our lives. As we recite and remind ourselves of what we believe, we're also reminding ourselves who's in control of all things, both of our salvation and in our day-to-day -day living in this world. And so would you join me, Christians, and confessing your faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. 
from where he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. from 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 12 through 26. For just as a body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. So all were a single member, what, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I do not need you, nor the head to the feet, I do not need you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And those parts of the body that we think less honorable would bestow greater honor. And our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, which are more presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. This ends the reading of God's holy word. Perfect submission Today's reading is from 2 Corinthians, the 5th chapter, verses 17 through 21. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is passed away, behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. 
For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Here ends the reading. As you know, as our congregation is walking through this coronavirus with our country right now, there are a lot of expanded opportunities for ministry. There are people who are coming to us at our church and asking for help and aid during this time. Financially, provision for uh, supplementation of income, provision of food, and we've tried to come alongside and help them as best we can. We also have uh, our church facility to upkeep and employee payrolls to continue to meet. And so we'd ask that you would join us in partnering with the ministry that's ongoing here at our congregation. Now, there's two ways for you to do that. First is your opportunity to, uh, to go on online to our website and to give that way. If you go to www.livingwordaflc.org slash online giving, there will be a directions of how to give securely online through our website. The other option is to send a check in through the mail to our church office to 4300 Nichols Road in Egan, Minnesota, 55122, and our office administrator will process that and deposit, send you a receipt for that. We thank you on behalf of our church for continuing to support us as we walk through this adventure that God has called us to and seek to continue to minister to people faithfully. My Jesus, I love thee. I know thou art mine, for thee all the follies of sin I resign. My gracious Redeemer, my Savior art thine. i
come to gather around God's word today, one of the things that we hold to here at Living Word is that when we come to the Bible, that this is not just a book of some friendly suggestions or opinions of men, but that this is the inspired and inerrant word of God, true from cover to cover. And so because of those convictions, we come with an expectancy today. We come with an expectancy that God desires to use his word in a miraculous and powerful way in our lives. That, that he comes by his Holy Spirit to accompany his word to convict us of sin and to point us to our Savior, Jesus Christ, and then to teach us how to live as Christians. And it's my prayer that as we come to God's word, that your heart would be open and receptive to the work of God in your life. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we take this time now as a church family to gather around your word. And I pray, Lord, that you would allow us to not just be hearers of your word only, but Lord, that you would allow us to put this into practice in our lives, that you would be our teacher and guide and allow this word to sink deep into our hearts. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as we continue on from last week, we're going to be still looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 12 today and would invite you to turn there in your Bibles and follow along. Last week, we were looking at the earlier portion of 1 Corinthians 12 and, and looking at spiritual gifts. And today we're going to continue on uh, 1 Corinthians 12 verses 12 through 26 as we consider the body of Christ picture that Paul paints. And what does it look like to be working together as the church? Starting there with verse 12, Paul writes this, Just as a body, though one, has many parts, but all of its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. And Paul's point right away, as he kind of sets up this imagery, is that God has brought together a lot of different moving parts to be a part of his church. And maybe that's no surprise to you. Obviously, there are different members. But what Paul's point with all of this is to demonstrate is that even though there's diversity, there's unity. Let me say that again. Even though there's diversity, there's unity. And sometimes we need to remember that as Christians and kind of keep that in the forefront of our minds. It's so easy for us to see distinctions or, or differences in the body of Christ and fail to focus on the fact that it's all one body. That God in his divine wisdom and sovereignty has called all of these different parts together for his purpose and his function. And that's what we have in the church today as well. And so even though there might be different people with different gifts, different abilities, God's delight and his joy is to bring all of those together in order for his whole body to be built up and encouraged. And so with that kind of as our backdrop, let's look at verses 15 and 16. Paul says, Now, if the foot should say, Well, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. And if the ear should say, Because I'm not an eye, I don't belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. And some of you, friends, you need to hear what Paul is saying here. He, he's painting this picture of, of some parts of the body that are looking at other parts of the body and saying to themselves, well, I'm not like that, and so therefore I must not belong. I, I don't have those gifts or those functions, and so therefore I must be kind of worthless or unimportant, or, or maybe I should just separate myself. I'm not needed. And, and there's this tendency sometimes in the church to instead of judge other people to judge ourselves and it's kind of an interesting thing that takes place you, you would expect that it's easy sometimes to look and judge others but sometimes far easier it is for us to compare ourselves with others and to judge ourselves and Paul is writing to this first group of you who maybe need to hear that today. And he's reminding you that you are important part of the body of Christ. Just who you are. That God has uniquely crafted you, designed you to be exactly a part of the body that he's intended. 
I remember that uh, when I was growing up as a youth in our church, there was another guy in our youth group which, uh, who I'll call Randy, and it seemed like he was good at everything. He was really popular. He knew everyone really well. Uh, everyone was his friend. He was very athletic. He knew how to play guitar, and he wasn't afraid to get up and speak in front of people. And, and I remember in my heart looking at Randy and thinking, man, that's what a real Christian looks like. If only I could be like Randy, if only I had those gifts and those abilities, then I would really be able to be used by God. And perhaps some of you have had those feelings as well. Perhaps some of you are tempted to look at your life and then to look at others in the body of Christ and think, well, there's Kyle and he's really gifted and really great and I don't have those gifts. And, and there's Jackie and she's got such a beautiful voice and she can do this, this, and this. And, and I can't do those things. And, and we can tend to start thinking of ourselves as maybe just one step ahead of the trash heap in the corner. We start looking at our lives and we start thinking maybe God made a mistake. Maybe he's crafted everyone else to be wonderful and purposeful. But we tend to look at our life as junk. And maybe we would never say that out loud. Maybe we would never say, you know, I feel like I'm just one step ahead of the garbage can. But we live our lives thinking in that way. You know, we, we perceive of ourselves in that manner. But what does God's word say? How would God's word come alongside those of you who maybe are, are tempted to be thinking in that manner? Well, in verse 17, Paul says this, If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? You see, each part of the body is different and needed. Each of them are forming different functions. They don't all have the same function. And, and if they did, how horrible would that be? I mean, just think if, if everyone was Pastor Nathan Olson. All we would have is just messages all the time, and, and uh, that would be pretty boring. What happens if everyone was a Leanne and we just had a, a whole bunch of singers? That's all that we had. Uh, that would also get old after a while. You see, we need diversity. We need to recognize that God has given gifts and abilities to each one in order to there to be a whole picture that's beautiful. We see in verse 18 that God has placed everything in the body just as he wanted it to be. I want to read this verse for you. It says, But God has arranged the members in the body, each one of them, as he chose. That's verse 18. There, the picture that we get that Paul gives here is one of extreme intentionality by God. And God doesn't just roll the dice when it comes to his congregation. He has looked with great purpose at each of the gifts and abilities that you have and has put you in the, the congregation that you're in for a purpose, friends. To, to use those gifts and those unique abilities to build up that body. He, he, he doesn't look at your place in the church as some random appendage. He looks at it as purposeful. That your function is important to God. And some of you, honestly, maybe you have a hard time believing that. Maybe for some of you... It's hard for you to accept the fact that your gifts and abilities have been especially wired by God for the context that you're in. Maybe it's easy to, for yourself to look at your life and think, I just feel worthless. And, and I want to remind you, friends, for those of you who feel that way, that that's not what God's word says about you. In Psalm 139, verse 14 through 16, God describes creating and crafting you even before you were born in your mother's womb, crafting you with intentionality and design, with specificity, knowing each of your days before they were even going to come to be. And so for those of you who, who maybe are struggling with your place in the body, I want you to remember this. God has put you there with a plan and a purpose. He's given you your gifts that are different than mine. He's given you your calling which is different from each every member, but all of them, all of that diversity to be used for the building up of the body of Christ, that in this diversity, we would find unity. 
Others of you who are listening today, maybe you don't struggle with recognizing your gifts. Maybe it comes very uh, easy for you to recognize how God's wired you and how he desires to use you as part of the church. And maybe for some of you, there's actually this idea, yeah, I'm needed. In fact, I'm really needed. If I wasn't a part of the body, it would suffer. Uh, maybe you come to an awareness of that. And I want you to notice that Paul also speaks to that group of you as well. And if you have your Bibles, look there at verse 21. Paul writes, he says, The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. You see, what Paul is confronting here in the Corinthian church is not just the group that feels worthless or maybe that God made a mistake with their functionality, but he's also addressing, addressing another group that is tempted to look at some of those other parts of the body and look down on them. Maybe to say, well, you know, we could probably get along without you. Or maybe tempted to think, well, I have, I have everything together. I'm kind of able to carry us through this. And Paul reminds that group of people that each and every part of the body is intentionally there by God. And not just there intentionally, but also we hear in verse 22 that the parts of the body that seem to be weaker, Paul says, are indispensable. And that means we can't do without them. They are a vital part of the whole thing. God's point, friends, is that even for, for those who maybe have everything figured out in their lives, how God's wired them, and they're secure in that, to also be secure in recognizing God's use and intentionality for everybody, not just for you. That God desires for your eyes to be opened, that even those parts of the body that seem weaker, that don't have all their act figured to, out together yet, that God looks at them as important and vital and indispensable. Uh, when I was doing some research on this, I was trying to think if there's a part of my own body that I feel like I could do without. And I was trying to think of some different parts. And one of that I was thinking about was my little tiny toe on the edge of my foot, you know, the baby toe. I was thinking, well, I could probably do without that toe. It's kind of small, just kind of on the edge there, you know, pretty insignificant. And then I was, as I was researching a little bit, I thought, oh, if I lost that toe, it would be pretty hard to do most things. You see, that, that tiny toe that seems so insignificant and useless, that toe is there that, that keeps my balance as I'm walking, as I'm running, as I'm doing things with my kids. That toe is a vital part of me functioning and getting around. And that's the kind of point that Paul is trying to make here in this verse. The parts of the body that seem small, that seem weak, that seem insignificant, they actually have a huge part to play in the body of Christ. They are indispensable. They are needed. They are important to the functioning of the whole thing as it works together. And so Paul's point for you, second group, is that you need to start having eyes for people like God does. And instead of looking at people and putting labels on of weak, insignificant, unimportant, to rather look at that group and see these are people who God has chosen, called, he's brought into the body of Christ with intentionality. They are indispensable to God. And when we are tempted, friends, to look at other people around us in the body of Christ with a demeaning attitude or, or looking at them as weaker or insignificant, what we're also doing is we are belittling the work of Christ on their behalf. You see, Jesus looked at all of us in the church and he said, I'm going to lay down everything for you. I'm going to lay down even my life for you. I'm going to make a public declaration of how important you are to me. And when we look at those parts of the body that we think are weak or insignificant or unimportant, and we say, you know what, maybe it would be better if they weren't here. Maybe we don't even say that, but we think it in our minds. What we're doing is we're saying, Jesus, your sacrifice for them was unimportant. Your, your decision, your choice of calling them to yourself, I disagree with. And in a way, friends, we put ourselves in the place of God. 
And we actually are saying that that God's decision and his way of doing things weren't good enough. And so I would caution you with that as well, friends, to instead of looking in judgment or in a demeaning way toward parts of the body of Christ, instead to have the eyes of God for the people in his church, to see people as he sees them, to love people as he loves them, to recognize how valuable in the sight of God these people are. And that it's not just those people, that for both groups, for for those who maybe feel like they're comparing themselves with others and maybe feel worthless to those who are looking down on them, that God desires for both people to see his love for the whole church. That God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. And that's God's heart for the whole world. And that's God's heart for those who are in the church. His heart is that they would recognize his unending love for them, for you. And as you are listening to this message today, as you think about applying this to your life, I want you to think about it, applying it in two ways. First, stop for a moment and recognize how much God loves you. That he has called you to be a part of his body that he has laid down everything for you, that he has uniquely wired and gifted you as he desires for you to be, functioning and serving in his body. Secondly, to have an awareness of each part working together for the common good. We, We heard about that last week when we were talking about spiritual gifts. God's desire is for each part of the body to be functioning and serving for the building up of the whole. Every one of those people is needed. None of them are dispensable. God doesn't make junk. And we need to look at people as God looks at them and to love them and to care for them and to come alongside them as God does. And that's my prayer for you as a pastor. My prayer for you as a pastor is that as you hear these words from 1 Corinthians 12, that you would think about how God desires for you to put them into play in your life. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this word and the time to meditate on it today. I pray, Lord, that you would use it in the lives of those listening to bear fruit, fruit that will last. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And now receive the benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his grace and peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.